So we have made it to the halfway point in the season. It is time for the 2020 All-Star break. Now, I am actually not going to be showing the All-Star teams because I totally blanked and forgot to record them. And then when I had already simmed like a month or so into the future, recorded a bunch of more games and whatnot, and uh, then I realized that I had not recorded the All-Star teams. So I went back and I realized that if I show you, it's going to spoil at least one of the trades that I make. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, you just have to imagine who had the All-Star game based on the league leaders that I'll show you because that's what's going to happen. I will tell you that both Robinson Chirinos and Jose Leclerc both made the All-Star team, though. So first things first, let's take a look around the league at the standings as far as the American League in the East. The Yankees are sitting at first place atop the division, but the Blue Jays have actually been surprisingly good this year. Uh, obviously, they have a good roster with a bunch of young players, but uh, nobody really expected them to be good this year, but they are indeed in this version of uh, MLB The Show. So they are in second place in front of the Rays, who are in third, who are also still in the race as well. In the AL Central, you've got Cleveland at the top of the division with the Twins and the White Sox right behind them. This is always by far the most boring division for me in all my franchises, because every year it's like, oh, Cleveland won yet again, Cleveland at the top of the division, Cleveland did it again, Cleveland, 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 maybe the Twins will challenge, nope, Cleveland. Well, hopefully the Twins and White Sox are good enough in this game to where it's not just Cleveland winning the division every single season. Then in the American League West, you've got the A's and the Astros who are tied for first place, while the Angels are only two and a half, game backs from, two and a half games back from them. And we got a three-way race going for the top spot in the AL West. And then all the way back and forth is us 15 games back. And somehow the Mariners are even worse than us back in fifth place. Uh, taking a look at the National League, you've got the East where the Braves are sitting firmly atop the division. But then the Phillies and the Marlins are both 500? Or both above 500? Uh, the Marlins? That's just, it's very odd to see the Marlins actually be above 500, considering they're just never like that in The Sims. While the Nationals and the Mets have been quite bad, the Nationals not looking like they're going to be defending their title this season. Uh, the NL Central, the Brewers have a firm 12 and a half game lead on the second place Reds, while the Reds and the rest of the division are just all not very good. They're all under 500, so the Brewers are just running away with the NL Central already. While in the National League West, the Dodgers already have a big 10 and a half game lead with 66 wins on the season. The Padres are a very good team. They have 57 wins, I want to say, and they're just stuck behind the Dodgers. Like, they would be right there with the Brewers if they were in that division, but they're not. They're behind the Dodgers, so they have to compete for a very deep wild card race that is in the National League. And now if we take a look at some of the players on our Texas Rangers, our best bat this season has been Ronald Guzman. Pretty much the whole season, really. He's been in a platoon where he only plays against right-handed pitching, and he is raking against that right-handed pitching. He has 15 home runs, 872 OPS. Uh, he might end up playing against lefties at some point as well, because Greg Bird has not been very good in that spot, but we will get onto that a bit later on in the video. Robinson Chirinos also having a great year, OPS over 800. He is on a one-year deal, so he will be shopped at the trade deadline as well. Uh, Todd Frazier also having a solid season. Nothing too great, but definitely one of our better bats on the team. He is also on a one-year deal, so we'll probably look to trade him as well at the deadline. Uh, Willie Calhoun at one point was the best bat on our roster this season, but his OPS is now down to 777, 777 and he is not getting on base at all with a 314 OBP, so not what you like to see from Willie Calhoun, who was very, very solid early season, but has started to cool down quite significantly. Uh, Matt Duffy has been a guy who gets on base off the bench, but has no power whatsoever, as usual. I haven't shown too much of him, because I don't really use him too much in-game, and uh, I don't really have any plans for Matt Duffy in the future of this franchise. Danny Santana had a career year in 2019, but he is not so much having a career year in 2020. OPS is 724, uh, not really hitting well, not getting on base, not really doing anything other than just hitting the occasional home run. Uh, he'll also be playing more right field in the second half of the season because he has that strong arm, 
and I feel like he just doesn't have the fielding skills to patrol center for us, so he's not going to be playing center anymore. He's going to be spending the rest of the season over in right field, and we'll get on who's playing center later on in the video. Elvis Andrus is an awful bat to have. He's an aging shortstop who we have locked in through 2022, making $15 million a year. Uh, doesn't get on base. He's not fast anymore. Only an okay fielder. Uh, pretty much, he's going to end up being a bench player at some point in the duration of this franchise over the next couple seasons once we get a legit young shortstop to take over at that position. We've also got Shinsu Chu, who was on the last year of his deal. Might be the last year of his career uh, if he ends up retiring. Probably will, but you never really know with what the MLB The Show retirements do. Uh, just recently returned from his injury as well. Hasn't been good this year before the injury. And we cannot trade him at the deadline because no one would want a old DH who's not performing. Then we have Isaiah kiner Falefa, who really hasn't done much of anything this season. He's an interesting player as a guy who's a backup catcher and infield depth, but there's really nothing too interesting about how he's been playing this season. Uh, Joey Gallo, in my opinion, is the number one story so far through the 2020 season for us. Joey Gallo just forgot how to do all the things that Joey Gallo is good at. He has a 288 OBP and a 312 slugging percentage, which is just, when evaluating Gallo, those are the numbers that matter to me. I do not care what his average is. I do not care how many strikeouts or RBI he has. If you do care about those stats, well, there's plenty of old baseball games being shown on a plethora of different channels that I'm sure you can go watch instead of this. And because Gallo is having such a bad season, it leaves us in a tricky spot where he is ideally the centerpiece of our franchise for years to come. He has two seasons of team control left after this season, so 2021 and 2022. And I do want to sign him long term, but I don't want to sign him to a huge deal. And then he turns out to just be bad in The Sims for whatever reason. Uh, so what we're probably going to end up doing is seeing how he plays next season... And then if he does have a good season next year, then we'll probably sign him long term and he will be around for probably the duration of this franchise. But with that being said, Santana, since he is playing right field, Gallo is now going to be playing center field. He takes over the center field duties. I mean, he's just the best option we have to play in center field right now, so we're going to roll with it. We also have Nick Solak on the team, who has been bad. A sub-600 OPS. Uh, I've read that his number one tool is his bat. I have not seen evidence of any of that in the 2020 season. I can't even hit with him in the games that I play either. Uh, Adalas Garcia has also been bad. He just can't hit. Uh, just that's really all that's his deal is he can't hit. Greg Bird, not even 100 ABs yet for us, but he has been bad in the 83 ABs that he does have for us. And then Rugnet Odor has been beyond bad. Bad would be an improvement for what he is right now, and he is coming back from his injury fairly soon, so hopefully he can try to not be awful like he is right now, or like he was before he went down with the injury. And then Andy Abanez is also coming back fairly soon-ish as well, so hopefully he can keep up the success he was having at the Major League level. And now if we move on to the pitching side of things, we've got Corey Kluber, who is not having his best season, but I'm not going to complain about those numbers. Also, his ERA could be 47, and I would still try to trade him at the deadline, so Kluber is definitely a guy who's going to be getting shopped around quite a bit at the deadline. Mike Miner has been extremely good for us, definitely our ace so far. And he also happens to be in the last year of his deal, so he is also going to be traded at the deadline. That will leave Lance Lynn as the new number one guy, and he's been solid. Can't complain about his numbers. Uh, Jordan Lyles, who is supposed to be our number five guy. Those are good numbers for a number five guy. Even for a four or three guy, those are pretty solid numbers, so I'm definitely not complaining about what Jordan Lyles has been doing for us. But Kyle Gibson has not been doing well at all. He got off to a really bad start to the year, kind of settled down for like two, maybe three starts, and now he's back to struggling again. Hopefully he can figure it out in the second half of the season, considering we have him for multiple more seasons on a long-term deal, or I think it's like a three-year deal. So I would ideally like him to actually be good for those years we have him signed. Now onto the bullpen, guys, we have Jesse Chavez, who is unfortunately out for the rest of the season with a torn rotator cuff, and that means his time in a Rangers uniform will come to an end at the end of the season. Uh, Rafael Montero, 
as you can see, he is a guy who was getting a lot of innings pitched, and that is leading me to believe that I'm probably going to start rolling with no long relievers in our pen, which would mean I get one more bench player, because you cannot have an eight-man bullpen in this game without having one of them being a long man, because you just can't put him anywhere else. I don't think the relief pitcher role is available, but even then, if it is, I really doubt the CPU sims even use the relief pitcher role that's available in, like, the 40-man call-ups from previous games. It's just the way this game sims the games, it gives your long man so many innings, it prioritizes that guy in, like, every single situation, and he ends up with starter-type innings pitched at the end of the season. I've had seasons where my long reliever ends up in the innings pitched league leaders or other categories that relievers just should not end up being in, and I'm not going to quick manage every single game to prevent that because I already do an incredible amount of micromanaging everything in this series. And it just sucks a ton of fun out of playing the actual series. So I'm just not trying to add even more of that garbage to my plate. So yeah, we're just going to essentially roll with one less reliever, a seven-man bullpen, and I think it's like a five-man bench. We've also got Demarcus Evans, who his deal this whole season has been he walks way too many batters. He has a 9.77 walk rate, which is just not good at all. Uh, he's striking out a good amount of hitters, though. He just needs to cut down on the walks, and he could be a very solid reliever for us if he can do that. Uh, Shane Carl is actually a guy who has been really solid for us. I didn't really think anything of him when I was looking at the roster and starting this franchise, but he's actually been quite impressive, so Shane Carl is definitely a guy who has caught my interest. Uh, Nick Goody hasn't been good. Nothing else to really say about him. Jose Leclerc has been striking at hitters at a ridiculous rate, and his walk rate hasn't been totally out of control either. So Jose Leclerc is a guy who has been very solid as our closer. Brett Martin has been solid as well, but he's definitely not striking at as many hitters as I thought he'd be, which is odd because he has white bat stuff with his slider. And then we also have Juan Nicasio, who has been solid as well. Uh, he is definitely going to be traded at the deadline to someone who is desperate for bullpen help. And now let's do a quick little rundown of the league leaders around the American and National Leagues. In the American League side of things, the hitting leader and average is Luis Arias. Uh, hits leader is J.D. Martinez. The top five guys in home runs is Fran Mel Reyes, Francisco Lindor, Nelson Cruz, Jordan Alvarez, and Aloy Jimenez. The stolen base leader is actually a veteran outfielder Cameron Mabin. The OBP leader so far with his 453 OBP is Mike Trout. And then the war among hitters is Trout, Lindor, Rendon, Tim Anderson, and Alex Bregman. On the pitching side of things, you have Ryan Barucki from the Toronto Blue Jays, who is the ERA leader. The strikeout leader is Garrett Cole, and then the war leader is also Garrett Cole, followed by Paxton. Reynaldo Lopez, who is a surprising name to see on there. Uh, Tanaka and Giolito from the White Sox. And then on the National League side of things for hitting, you have Wilson Ramos leading the league in average. Their hits leader is Nick Markakis, the veteran. Their home run leaders are Yelich, Hoskins, Eugenio Suarez, Max Muncy, and Keston Hura. Their sto uh, stolen base leader is Jonathan Villar of the Miami Marlins. And then their war leaders are Bellinger, Ramos, Suarez, Akiyama from the Reds, and Kane. Uh, the pitching side of things, the ERA leader is Chris Paddock, the strikeouts leader is Max Scherzer, and the National League war for pitchers is top two, Clayton Kershaw and Madison Bumgarner, like we're in like 2013, and then it's followed by Strasburg, DeGrom, and Austin Nola, or Aaron Nola, not Austin Nola. And then just a quick rundown of what our trade block looks like. We've got Corey Kluber, Mike Miner, and Robinson Chirinos on there. Those are the main three guys who should be able to get us some solid prospects at the deadline, especially Kluber with his A potential, and then Mike Miner with his just absurd season he's having. We've got Juan Nicasio, who's not going to get anything too major, but he will be traded to a team that needs bullpen help, which just everybody essentially does at the trade deadline. Uh, Todd Frazier is the same deal as Nicasio, but since he's a C potential, he's just probably not going to net that much either, but he is going to be traded. And as far as the trades that have happened so far in the season, there was that one uh, Jake Diekman of the Red Sox trade that happened very early on, and since then there have just been two trades, uh, both of them involving C potential prospects and like fringe big leaguers, so I had no issue with them. I don't even know if anybody even cares about these guys, but you're seeing it anyways. 
And that's going to wrap things up here for this edition of the Texas Rangers franchise. I've been your host, Jerseyborn, and I am saying, hook the... Thank <laughs> you.